Good morning, everyone. Welcome back from break. Uh, I'm going to start off as well apologizing at the beginning because I am Canadian as well, uh, based out of Toronto, and I'm apologizing actually because I don't think I'll be nearly as funny or entertaining as the last guy that you guys saw up on stage. Um, but, you know, at the same time, hopefully this topic is going to be really relevant for data engineers, architects, um, as you start building out more and more Spark applications, uh, really considering and making the right choices when it comes to storage. Uh, my name is Mladen Kovacic, I'm a senior solutions architect out of Cloudera, and again, based out of Toronto, and I'm happy to be here today. Um, so this talk is going to go through uh, several simple categories. We're going to give some motivation about what we're really talking about today. We'll talk about storage capabilities, and a lot of these technologies are already very familiar to you, most likely, but we're going to talk about them in a very specific way so that we talk about your overall architecture and how they fit into your organization. And then we're going to um, take that conversation a little bit higher, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, how do we ask the right sets of questions for determining which storage engine I'm going to use for my Spark application. And finally, hopefully, we'll, we'll give you some hints and tips on how you can really choose the right um, storage solution for your Spark applications. So here we go. Spark. Spark Streaming, Spark SQL, um, fantastic processing engine, fantastic processing framework So for all of our data at large scale, solving real business problems. This is fantastic, and this is why we're all here today at Spark Summit. But what we really want to think about is storage considerations make or break the deal sometimes when it comes to how are we going to build our application so that it's really sustainable and that it's really fitting the use case that we have it for. Now, Spark is great because of the great community of everyone contributing to this product because it has such great integration with a variety of storage systems. And of course, we're going to zero in on just a, a few popular choices, but they're by no means a complete exhaustive list. However, the reason that we chose them is because they really kind of showcase uh, some of the various capabilities that we have in the big data stack, um, and particular for the Spark ecosystem. Now, how we're going to frame the discussion about which storage case to really think about is we're going to look at a little bit more outside just Spark, but think about the overall ingest pipeline. How is this data going to be coming in? And also on the consumer side, how is this data going to be consumed by the real users and the business users at the end of the day that are making decisions and bringing out the value out of that data? When we think of design patterns, we can think of it in two main aspects of the Spark processing framework. On the left-hand side of this diagram, we basically have the Spark streaming source, or we have batch-type sources that are coming in from distributed file systems um, or other types of storage engines that we want to read in, we process something, and we emit some output. Pretty much any kind of computational framework, you have input, you process something, and you have some output. What this talk is going to focus on is on the right-hand side. This right-hand side talks about four different technologies, right? HDFS, HBase, Kudu, and Solar. Um, I put down the years of when these technologies actually hit the market. And what we're going to notice out of these 2006, 2008, 2007, a number of these technologies have been around for quite some time. They have been proven. They have been around for a while. And then all of a sudden, we see that um, a project like Apache Kudu comes out last year that really comes in at a time when you start to realize that there are some gaps. You start to realize that there are some gaps in the overall ecosystem. There have been many variations of HDFS, HBase, and Solar, perhaps, in the marketplace up until not last year. But I think we're going to be able to describe what some of those gaps are and what gaps Apache Kudu is trying to solve. That being said, it's also a very new project, and maybe we're not talking about as many features as much as focused features that are focused for the types of problems we're trying to solve. So HDFS. Everyone knows this one. It's been around for a long time. Distributed file system, cheap, scalable storage. It's the fundamental basis for how we've really uh, revolutionized the industry of data management and data processing today. It's an immutable type of file system. We know this. Um, records, modifying records within this kind of file system is absolutely very, very difficult to do. I, and I think any time that we spend in this space, we get to know that. Of course, multiple file formats have come in to place to help with analytics, in particular, things like uh, columnar-type storage formats of, of Parquet and others. 
And of course, we also have that SQL overlay on top of HDFS that allows us to access this data that could be quite arbitrary, actually. Um, sometimes we want to optimize under the covers, but we want to be able to access this data through SQL, and Spark SQL is, of course, a, a uh, first-tier application on top. But the highlights for the conversation of this talk and framing our uh, conversation very particularly is we want to talk about the highlights are very, very high throughput. It's extremely scalable, and it's meant for high, high throughput, which means that your analytic queries can be absolutely top-notch. But the second aspect of this type of storage system is it's very painful for I.O. You don't want to do I.O. It's extremely painful, and anyone that's actually dealt with anything to do with uh, slowly changing dimensions or fast changing dimensions in your data, it becomes an extremely tedious task to, to do that kind of work. It's not meant for it. You have batch-oriented type processing. That's the uh, framework that's meant for that. And what we start realizing is in order to be able to mimic certain systems and be able to get certain value out of HDFS, it actually requires a lot of coding effort, a lot of overhead costs in terms of coding and architecture in order to get it to work just right. Uh, small files problems have come up several times in these talks, and this is uh, like no other. So the other nice thing about HDFS is, though, that it is just a file system. So any kind of file can be landed there, and you'll be pretty happy. The design pattern and integration with Spark is pretty simple. I mean, you have Spark streaming, Spark or Spark streaming on the left side. You land this content in, in HDFS. But as we tear it apart a little bit, we talked about small files that could be accumulating. Um, how do you deal with those small files that accumulate, especially in Spark streaming in particular? There's various ways of doing it. We talked about external processes that you've heard at this conference. But you also have abilities where, I mean, you can think of an um, or architect your application so that you build an application logic to actually deal with any of the compactions that you want to do. But it is complicated. There's also partition management that you might have to consider. Managing metadata carefully for those systems, external systems that might depend on the Hive Metastore. Um, as you do compactions, you need to think about um, moving partitions and metadata about your partitions from one angle to another. So it becomes challenging uh, to deal with it. At the same time, your analytics are extremely fast once you get it going. In comes HBase. So HBase is a NoSQL engine. Um, it manages its files under the covers in HDFS, um, but really it's an application that sits on top of HDFS, leveraging HDFS for its, its capabilities. However, it provides the user, you and I, the ability to store content in HBase in an extremely fast, now mutable way. So no longer are we really stuck in that immutable world. We're now doing insert updates and deletes at a very, very high pace. Um, and one of the unique properties of HBase is this um, very nice ability of not only thinking of your data in sets of tens or hundreds of columns, you can have a storage engine that now think, thinks about uh, data in thousands and millions of columns that you can actually support for a given row. So how I like to position HBase is really thinking about entity type data. So the entity type data is data that we're talking about profiles of people, we're thinking of profiles of devices, of accounts, things that we require very, very fast lookups. Think of it as, an, um, as a key value distributed store so that you can very, very quickly do lookups on particular um, accounts or devices or people. So the highlights of this particular technology is very, very fast random I.O. However, it comes at a cost of very low throughput. And what I mean by that is if you want to do large aggregate type queries on top of an HBase storage system, it's very, very painful, and we would discourage you from doing so. Next, it is still near real-time oriented. So if the speed of your data is still very fast and it's changing, um, coming in very quickly, you want to be able to change it. But at the same time, it challenges you on the BI side. There's no strict data types, which is also a positive, sometimes a negative, because you have to deal with binary types, and that's a little more difficult than dealing with actual static types. But at the same time, you have a lot of flexibility. The design pattern with Spark, again, is very simple. You can have your Spark or Spark streaming application, and you write directly out into HBase. There's a couple of references here for you to look at. But uh, really, you have an HBase connection everywhere in your Spark job, Spark streaming. Uh, you have Spark SQL and data frames APIs on top of, Spark, on top of HBase as well. Um, HBase can really serve your applications where it could be the primary storage engine for your ingestion framework, um, but it can also be complementary in terms of preserving state of your overall application. 
It's a NoSQL store versus unstructured, um, versus structured, and again, near real time. Now, when we think of our data, when we think of analysis and the pace of data, we can think of it in those two um, verticals or attributes. So we can think of the pace of data. Where does HTVS really fit in? If we think of the pace of data, we're thinking of unchanging append-only type use cases. As soon as we think of real time, we start dealing with a lot of problems and a lot of issues that we have to deal with, particularly with small files, particularly with changing uh, values that are coming in in very, very rapid pace. On the flip side, when we think of our analysis graph, we can think of HTFS being really good for arbitrary storage, so just storing it long term, or doing fast analytical scans on your existing data. HBase, on the other hand, is extremely fast at doing all those lookups for you, doing lookups on all that profile data. It's extremely fast at ingesting this data that could be changing. But what happens is, when you actually want to run BI reports on top of something that was very quickly changing and coming in, all of a sudden you start coming into this complex hybrid architecture approach where really you want to land all this stuff in this changing, mutable kind of storage system like HBase. You need to extract it, you need to build out all this code and architecture to feed it back into HDFS and then start doing analytics and BI dashboards on top. What that means though is that you're gonna now have a gap both in performance because uh, it takes a while for you to actually export it from HBase into HDFS you also have to deal with complexity of architecting such a framework. And you also need to think about your overall security strategy. Have you thought through all the security elements of authorization and authentication all the way through from uh, before you started ingesting to Spark streaming into HBase and down into HDFS? Make sure that you've architected all of those bits and pieces correctly. So this is where Kudu really steps in, into play. This is something that's actually pretty new and it's also pretty niche here. Um, where we don't see many systems that are capable of doing all of these things all in one shot. We have a storage system for tables of structured data. Now, we can have an entire talk just on Kudu, of course, uh, to get you guys a lot more familiar, but what I'm going to say is just think of it as storage only. It's for this concept of tables, and it's for this concept of structured data, specifically structured. Now, the other thing that comes with that kind of sentence and that kind of description is that it's really a bring your own SQL engine to the game. And so Spark SQL is definitely integrated with Kudu directly. You can access it both through an API, but also through SQL itself. It's a columnar storage engine that allows you to partition your data by range and or by hash. Now, it has a limited number of columns, so we don't want to go out to the thousands or millions like the way HBase does. It's limited, but it's strongly typed. So some of the highlights of it is that it's fast random I.O., but not as fast as HBase. It's also got very fast throughput, but not quite as fast as HDFS. It's near real-time oriented, so it's excellent for insert updates and deletes. It's terrific for BI, because as soon as those da that data comes in, it's immediately available to you, and it is dealing with structured data. So when we think of the design pattern between Spark Streaming and Kudu, data frames are a perfect match for Kudu because you already have the strong types, you already have the structure, you already have SQL that you're applying to your data set, and now you start landing it into Kudu directly. So it becomes a very easy one-to-one -one mapping. Then data is available immediately to your SQL engines, whichever engine that might be, and the ideal case, the niche case, is event-based um, processing for Kudu, where we're talking about high amounts of it depends with moderate amounts of updates. So this analytic gap that we talked about earlier, this ability to ingest data extremely quickly and then export it out, out into um, HDFS becomes much simpler to do when you have a technology like Kudu under the covers. Now the fourth technology we'll talk about is solar, and this now changes the game a little bit where it's different from everyone else. It's a distributed index enabling search capabilities. So it is typed, it has a REST API in order to make a whole bunch of query calls, it has a search index for query processing under the covers, so really you're able to apply search on top of all of your big data sets. Now again, some of the highlights, it is very good for high random I.O. It, we say low throughput in this case, again, because if you're doing aggregate and analytic type queries, it doesn't actually perform as well. It's not meant for that. But it does give you multifaceted use cases, and we'll give an example in a little bit. Um, again, near real-time oriented. It's terrific for BI, but with the right tools. 
So oftentimes we think of that transition, and I see this all the time, of companies coming over to big data because they just want to do SQL over and over and over again. They just want to do it cheaper, faster, more scalable. But SQL isn't the only way to interact with uh, your data. And having search overlay on top and the new tools that have come out in this space really enable you to do both search as well as SQL access as well as API calls um, to direct to engines such as HBase and Kudu are out there that help you visualize and understand your data. You have a loosely defined schema here, um, but again, you do have data types in Solar. Now, Solar has two ways that you can integrate with um, Spark. First one is with Spark, you can actually take your document, you can just pass it over to Solar, please index this for me, and thank you very much. The second way that you can actually organize it is you can build your pipeline to actually write into HBase, and HBase, as it writes to its write-ahead log, is that write-ahead log will be scraped by a Lily HBase indexer service, which will take whatever fields you want to actually take out of Solar, out of HBase, and index it into Solar. Now, what's really neat about this use case is that you can actually index a number of the fields that you like from HBase. You can make them now searchable in Solar, but um, Solar will actually give you a document ID back so that when you do your search in Solar, you can get a document or a list of document IDs back and do those very, very fast lookups back into HBase. And um, that's a great kind of topology on how you could actually index uh, information or make it searchable, the content that you'd like to pull out of uh, a content system like HBase. So we talked about the technology, and we're going to shift over now to the types of questions that we should kind of be asking, and what kinds of business problems are we trying to solve? One of the business problems that we can solve is uh, a question like this. How many voters have cast their ballots by city thus far in the election by the second? So this is a long question. This is one that people might be asking. And there are several attributes that we find out from this type of question. And what I think of is we want to know by the second. So that tells us that this is streaming type data. Uh, imagine we're streaming this data into some sort of voter ballot table. The next thing is we want to know how many voters. So it's kind of an aggregate type query. The next thing is, we, when do we want this data made available to us in our report? Well, we want it to be available immediately. So as soon as these ballots come in, it's streamed through, immediate access, aggregation, as well as streaming data. So with those three attributes in mind, that's really structured in its framework, we would position Kudu for that kind of technology, for that kind of question. On the flip side, we have a different kind of, kind of question. How many people watched last night's game compared to the night before? So in this question, you find out a couple properties about this data set. One of the properties is, well, how many people have watched last night's game? That's not up to the second reporting. It's basically saying, most likely this system has taken a list of events that had taken place yesterday, all the viewership events that took place yesterday. We take that content, we suck it into uh, something like HDFS. It's very easy to do that in batch. And all of a sudden, we want to do deep analytic type queries for top-notch performance out of these dashboards. Well, this is something that HDFS Parquet will be supreme at. So again, analytic type queries on slow data that's coming in. But it's all about the business question that's being asked. Another question that we might, might want to ask is, what version is my device running, and how many dropped packets do I have? So in this kind of question, we actually find out, well, I want to know devices. I have millions of devices in my environment. I would like to find out for a very specific device right now. So first off, we find out that maybe you have a system where you have many, many devices actually reporting into your data center, um, their current status of software versions and firmware versions that they're running. And along with those software and firmware versions, they might have metrics that are associated with those versions. Um, maybe those metrics exist. Maybe they don't actually exist. You know, when I ask about um, how many dropped packets, what if that software version didn't actually measure dropped packets? And so you find out you want something that's flexible. You want metrics that may change from one release to another. You might have lots of different updates that are happening. Um, it's hard to determine this schema ahead of time. So this is one of those aspects, again, where HBase would be a really, really neat fit. Very fast incoming data, many updates that are happening to existing devices, as well as being able to have arbitrary sets of columns and many, many different profile type columns. 
The last question we're going to talk about is, which tweets talk to the housing market in the 21 to 30 age group? And so when we think of tweets, we can think of near real time. It's streaming content that's coming in. Housing market is something like keywords, uh, keyword searches that are coming up. And then facet filtering really gets applied to the 21 to 30 age group. And so now a search type dashboard built on top of something like solar could really be useful to answer those kinds of questions. So use case, case, high level use case questionnaire that I think is really important whenever you start building out what kind of application you're going to be building using Spark is think about the overall ecosystem. First off, the guys that are actually going to be consuming this data, does my company and does my organization have the capabilities to do SQL only? Does it have the capabilities to do API lookups? Uh, some companies just don't have developers to start building out API calls. Are you investing in the right sorts of technologies that basically have the ability to interact with these varying sets of storage systems available in the big data space? Um, how near real time really is it necessary for those end consumers? Everyone I heard in the earlier talk today that they're saying everyone wants real time, but really, realistically, do you really need it? Uh, there are lots of challenges that come up with real time. Do you really need it? Find out those requirements ahead of time. The ingestion rate, think about the upstream team. How fast is this data going to be coming in? Can we actually keep up? Entity versus events. Is the data more entity-like, so we're talking about profile data, or is it more event-based, time series-like data? Uh, what is the, the uh, type of data that's coming in? What's the um, property of the data? Is it append-only? Is it moderate updates? Or is it many updates, or mostly updates? And then you can also think about questions like, well, what about distinct values in the data set? How many distinct values do I really have? So in the final two slides, I'm basically going to just show um, some of the storage considerations according to a set of criteria. You know, it, it's not always hard and fast rules, but it just kind of gives you, you know, uh, here's a more accurate representation. So here we go. SQL interface. If you want to access your data through SQL, HDFS is going to be excellent for that. Um, Kudu is also going to be terrific for that. Uh, we talked about the strong typing and how closely it is with Spark SQL. Solar is not meant for SQL access at all. And HBase, although it could be done, we really caution against it. And we generally uh, uh, try not to do any kind of SQL on top of HBase, even though technically it is capable of doing so. From an API perspective, if we're making API calls, well, Hadoop really isn't meant for that, or HDFS, I mean. Um, we really, I mean, through the API, what are we going to get? We're, we can get the file, and then what do we do with that, right? So it's not really API-like, but HBase, Kudu, and Solar definitely have uh, very strong API interfaces to interact, especially with other machines or other applications that you might have. Near real-time ingestion, again, HDFS just simply won't cut it. The other three will. Append only plus available for query. So what we mean is we're appending, 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 but we want that to be immediately available for querying, whether it be through API calls or through SQL. So this is where HBase, Kudu, and Solar do a really good job. Solar will index it very quickly, make it available to your search very, very quickly. As soon as you insert something into HBase, it's going to be available to pull out um, through API calls, though not as great for SQL. And again, Kudu, you'll be able to land something into Kudu and immediately pull it out through SQL or API, whatever you want to do. Now, HDFS, again, append only is OK, but making it available immediately for query is OK, except that you, you are dealing with some extra architectures, especially around small files that could accumulate in a platform like an HDFS system where you might have some delays in wanting to do compactions and things like that under the covers. Appends with moderate sets of updates, this is the bread and butter of Kudu. Again, something that Apache HBase and Solar can handle just fine. So those ones are all great engines for that. When it comes to mostly updates, we actually, again, HDFS is terrible. Um, HBase and Solar can do a great job with mostly updates as well. But Kudu, we really caution against it. It's not meant for that. It's, it's not meant for entity analysis. It's meant more for time series event-based processing, which typically has that attribute of coming, coming, coming in very, very quickly, um, mostly appends, and then sometimes you'll get some stragglers, sometimes you'll get some late coming events, sometimes you'll get updates to the existing events that were possibly updated since the last time that they were inserted. The next chart that I wanted to show you guys is thinking about entity-based data. So we talked about that. Entity-based data has arbitrary number of 
columns, arbitrary number of fields that could really grow at a rapid pace. So HBase is really, really great for that, similar with search. Event-based data, though, this is where Kudu shines the most. So you have event-based data coming in very quickly, and we want to make it available very quickly. This is where Kudu is going to shine. When you have a high number of distinct values, you know, search indexes in general don't really like high number of distinct values. They want to have a lot of values that are common between the different search engines and, or between all the different documents so that you can actually rank these documents. Finally, we're talking about many and unknown attributes. We talked about this with HBase, having many, many attributes. This is one of those properties of entities that um, we talked about software versions that could have all kinds of different metrics, storing those things in a very wide uh, table such as HBase, very sparse table, um, is really great in HBase. Now, when it comes to binary data, we think about images, PDFs, um, video files, audio files, and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, this is a great place for HDFS. Now, also in HBase, because everything has no real strong types, it's just a sequence of bytes, that's another area that you can actually store some of this kind of content. And then we're going to wrap it up with analytics. If you want to do analytics, you want to do very fast, responsive SQL queries on top, doing aggregations and all kinds of analytical type queries, this is where uh, HDFS is going to be the best but also Kudu is right alongside with it. So being able to do event-based data and analytics in Kudu is going to be the niche play. So finally, to wrap things up, um, I just want to make sure that as we build out new applications using Spark, that we think of the overall ecosystem, that we think of everything, the entire use case end-to-end, -end, think about it early on in the process of designing and architecting your solution. Understand the storage capabilities. We just gave a very, very brief rundown of the various storage engines that are out there, but understand what they can actually do and where they actually fit um, in the space. Ask the right questions. Figure out from upstream teams, how are you going to be delivering this data? What's this data coming in like? And also talk to the consuming teams. How are you actually going to consume this data? It might, might actually be another Spark application that's going to read this data back in later on. That's okay. Understand the downstream implications as to how consumers are going to come at this data. Make sure to consider security, architecture, and development costs throughout the entire process. Even though something can be done, it doesn't mean we should do it when it comes to how much development it would cost and how much architecture overhead we would have. And finally, hopefully that'll basically help us decide on the right, software, uh, right storage solution in the end for our Spark applications. Thank you. Thank you, Mlad, and that was a packed um, 28 minutes. We have two more minutes to uh, questions. We have two mics at either aisle. Please move if you have any questions. Go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk, uh, very helpful. Uh, do you consider Cassandra for the same purposes that you listed? Yeah, it's very similar to the HBase. Mm -hmm. I'll consider Cassandra being part of the HBase group of uh, products. Yeah, true, thanks. So in a similar question, Elasticsearch, Solar, yep. same things? Yep, it fits that same kind of space, exactly. And Elasticsearch does a great job for what it needs to do, but again, it's particular to the search space. Um, you highlighted some of the weaknesses of HBase being um, you know, schemaless and not very good for analytics. Do you see something like Apache Phoenix and the Kelt side developments as kind of bridging that gap, bring it closer to that, that analytics space? Yeah, Apache Phoenix is definitely trying to bridge that gap, uh, give you the SQL overlay. I believe it has indexes as well. It certainly does help, but again, because of the underlying framework of how HBase is built, it's just not going to be meant for strong analytics. Um, and we'll never be able to keep up with, let's say, if you did everything in Parquet or even with Kudu, um, how quickly these, these systems can actually respond to SQL type requests but certainly it helps bridge the gap and it has been there for a few years to help address that need. Hey, Next um, one. Uh, do I have time? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, if I'm making a story consideration for, um, for a platform where I have both event-based and profile-based data and uh, I need to do both uh, analytics and, and be a kind of reporting on so with a slowly changed dimension, uh, what would be the combination or what would be my considerations here? 
Yeah, so there's lots of combinations. I mean, you can build a pipeline that'll um, store that same content in two different engines. Um, it also depends on how quickly that data needs to be um, accessed by the end users. So sometimes you can pay the price of bringing that data um, over into an HBase or a Qt, well, an HBase system for top-notch performance for ingest, and then you could export it to HDFS. Again, um, Kudu can also help there depending on the type of entity. If the entity isn't actually um, branching out to too many attributes, but it's more um, statically oriented, then Kudu can be a really great fit there as well. But it's a longer conversation, uh, and this is exactly the types of conversation, ty types of conversations we're encouraging you to have. We can talk about more about it offline, um, but those are the kinds of conversations you want to have when you, when you think about those things. Um, can you make it really quick because we all are out yeah. of time? Where will you position uh, MongoDB? Where will you position MongoDB? Right. Well, I guess that's more of a document store. Um, I usually don't think of MongoDB in the space of big data. That's the only issue there. Um, I don't know. I don't know how I, I mean, in a MongoDB, that. just just another uh, way you can actually use Spark to actually get your documents. So right. in terms of, you know, you can choose what the, the name value pair you actually want to use, whether you want to use Cassandra, whether you want to use MongoDB for your more JSON-oriented documents. Yeah. So in that um, spirit, uh, give a big welcome to and a warm to Mladen um, Skadovic. Thank you all for coming.